What's up, Brock? Good to have you on the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Justin. I'm excited to be here. Well, it's always fun for me when we get to take our Lifestyle Investor Mastermind members and highlight and feature them. And uh, what's fun for me is even if we didn't have the mastermind, um, every one of the people in our community, I would easily highlight and spotlight because they're world beaters in their own right. And I, I love everyone's story. I love the expertise that people show up with. Your story is fascinating. And one of the cool stats about you is, uh, it, it was funny, I, I feel bad for Chris Board, who uh, is an NFL player, and you know, go check his podcast episode out. He got started in real estate super early. Right. Uh, but he got to say he was the youngest person in the mastermind, but only for like two weeks. Yep. Because then you joined and you're still officially the youngest person in the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind. So congratulations to you. And uh, I know people are going to be interested to know how you did it at such a young age. But uh, we definitely got to dive into your story and all the cool stuff you're up to. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited for it. And I'm glad I get to uh, continue to hold that title. That's wonderful. Well, uh, when I think about you, um, I think about someone that is young, hungry, eager, um, you know, takes full advantage of opportunities in front of him. And at this last year's Lifestyle Investor Mastermind retreat, you brought your father, who I'm really impressed with, um, who is just one of the most humble, kind, uh, intelligent people out there. And many would consider him uh, like an OG, one of the uh, wisest people in the financial space, right? He, you would never know it from meeting him, but he's been a huge mentor to you. He was a huge mentor to Garrett Gunderson, who's a good friend of both of ours. Uh, we feature Garrett at a ton of our events and, and he's been on the podcast. Um, but your dad is, is really kind of highly sought after in the financial space. And I, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts, like growing up with, uh, you know, such a stud in in your industry yeah uh, growing up was kind of interesting because i didn't actually know what he did um, until i got done i got to school i was going for accounting because that's what he did that's what uh my grandfather's did and i was like oh well i'll just do accounting and then i started doing my accounting homework and i'm like man if i miss in the beginning of this homework everything else is just screwed up and i'm like went home and i'm like dad i I can't do this accounting stuff. I, uh, I can't sit behind a desk. And he was like, well, how about you come to one of my workshops? And that, that point on, I think I was, um, I was 17 at the time. And I went to that workshop, lasted two days. And I was, I was like, all right, I know exactly what I'm doing with the rest of my life. This is it. I'm energized. I love this. Well, we'll have to dissect what that is a little more. But I've got to tell you, we share something in common because... I was originally an accounting major. And for anyone that knows me and knows my personality and knows what I love and what I don't love, I don't have any idea how I ended up there. I think someone told me they thought I would be good at it. And man, was I a uh, just so profoundly bored and, and unmotivated and uninspired, but B was so bad at it. Um, and, and so it's funny, you and I share this theme of like, Hey, I thought I was going to be an accountant. I started taking accounting classes. I dreaded accounting. Now I'm glad that I have a foundation of it. I'm glad that Absolutely. I understand, uh, you know, th there are some foundational concepts that I think are really important that everyone should know. And I'm really glad that I understand at least that, but I'm also so thankful that I can outsource this to, to, to a professional who's really good at it. I can pay, uh, you know, a, a best in class yep. um, provider to be my eyes and ears in the world of accounting. Yes. I hope I never, ever, <laughs> ever, ever, ever have to do a tax return. Yeah, no, no doubt. It's, uh, it's interesting. And by the way, you know, even my friends that are in this space are saying, you know, this is a dying industry. Uh, okay. It's harder to hire people. It's, it's an industry that um, there's just people are not lining up for the compensation is, is not adequate. We're having a lot of AI uh, and and software kind of stepping in. And uh, it's fascinating what's happening here and what will continue to happen. Now, if you're best in class, if you're elite, there's always going to be a spot for you and you can always charge a high ticket. And there are a lot of those out there. 
Uh, you know, the, the CPA firm that, that I use is just wonderful and incredible. And, and, you know, I'm so happy to pay them. I, I pay a lot, but it's not about how much you pay. It's how much are they saving you for what you pay, right? Uh, and so I'm thankful to have a, a, a top tier world class firm. But um, what did you end up doing? So instead of accounting, what did you realize that day at that workshop with your dad? Well, one, I wanted to get in the financial industry along the lines of financial strategy. Now, I will say, though I may not fully subscribe to the whole college and go get your degree, everything, I do have uh, a risk management and insurance degree, an accounting degree, and then a master's of finance. And what I did with those was not much, even though that they are in my world. Um, so now I'm typically working with younger, higher performing W2 earners and entrepreneurs on building these financial strategies for their lives. So I, I love that. I love the, you know, the competencies that you have, the expertise that you have. And we, by the way, agree on yet another thing. This is so fun. And uh, it's great because you and I have known each other for a while. You uh, are you've renewed as a, a second year member in the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind. And uh, and it's funny hearing some of our um, views and, and thoughts around education. Uh, we're so aligned. You know, I think outside of a few technical specialties, uh, you know, certain specializations are going to need some sort of, of degree, but most things can be learned, you know, on the job or through apprenticeships. And so outside of like a very small niche of industries, like attorneys are going to need more specific program school, doctors uh, and people in the medical profession. I mean, there's a handful of them, right? Um, but But outside of that, I do think that uh, the university, the college program, it's losing its luster. It's costing more than the benefit that you get. Uh, there's a lot of jobs that um, you can get paid really well and you don't need a degree for if you're uh, if you want to become a coder, if you want to become uh, experienced and, and knowledgeable in, in AI, artificial intelligence, um, you know, in robotics. There, there's so many different niches uh, in blockchain, I, I mean, there's so many niches where you don't need any formal education. And even in, in trades, uh, you, you can learn that through apprenticeship. You don't have to go to a technical college to learn these things. You can do it through on-the-job training. And so we're very much in agreement. I mean, my wife and I talk about this all the time that, um, you know, each of us went to college we feel like there's probably more negative influences than positive influences that we learned. Uh, th there are things that I'm appreciative that I have in terms of my background, my education, as I'm sure you are, you are you know, the same. But those could have been gained uh, in a faster fashion, a cheaper fashion, uh, a more specialized fashion. And oh, yeah. so, I, you know, we even say for our daughter, we don't we're going to support the route that she wants, but we really hope that she actually doesn't choose college. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I am a hundred percent on board with you. And I, as I looked at my own college career, I started working when I was 18. So I was, I had just started my freshman year of college. Well, by my sophomore year and on, I was making more money and making more decisions than almost all of my professors that I was learning under and even was asked to speak at a few of my uh, not only classes, but also events of the school. And so when I look at that, the, the, the profession that I chose, I chose also to be apprenticed and learn and get mentored within that space while I was at school. And so Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, I'd be working Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd be going to class, but my learning was massively expedited because I was in it and I was learning from the people that have been doing it for the longest time in the real world. Yeah. And there's a big difference between theory and actual, right? Uh, between mm -hmm. the real application. You know, I, I just remember all these classes is like the three keys to marketing and the five keys to accounting and the right. And it's like, this is so, um, outdated, unapplicable, um, just, so far off from what is really <laughs> happening. Like yeah. you hear these things that, you know, we're, we're both finance majors uh, and, and we both have a few different specialties around that. 
And, and when I look at what I learned and what the textbook said versus what the reality is and what I do today and what I've done in investing, it is vastly different. And, and it's quite comical. It's not even like it's a little different. It's like, here's the five keys that were supposed to be applicable. And then here's the real life application that doesn't even use any of the five keys. Yeah, 100 percent. I'd be asking class all the time. Well, Brock, well, how, you know, do you, are you seeing this in the in the real world? And you're and I, and I would sometimes politely say, hey, you know, sure, we see it every now and then. Other times be like, no, this just, it's just not happen in the real world. Well, I love what you're about. I love what you've built your business around. And so it, this whole idea. Uh, so number one, you started working at a young age, you really blossomed and, and, you know, kind of took off on a rocket ship and, and probably were an outlier and outperformed many of your peers, many of which being older than you. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just from a results and performance standpoint, but also from an income standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so I love that your niche in business is working with other young, high performing entrepreneurs and, and those in the W2 world. Um, but you focus on helping them build their financial life with both freedom and safety. Right. Um, and, and I think that that's important that they can coexist. Um, and, and what you say is that freedom without safeguards is only temporary. And I couldn't agree more with that, but I, I'd love for you to expand a little bit on it and, you know, even enlighten us as to, you know, kind of what you're teaching these, these business professionals, these, um, entrepreneurs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, first it does come down to that core aspect of freedom without safeguards is only temporary. And you can see that in area of any area of our life. Um, like the biggest form would be, you know, you win the lottery. Well, if you don't have safeguards in place, if you don't know how to handle that money, it's gone. Uh, the same could be said about By the way, most lottery winners go bankrupt. Exactly. exactly. So th this is not like, we're, you know, we're coming up with this, like factually, most people who win the lottery literally spend all the money and are not only back to zero, they're worse than zero because they have this uh, underlying debt. Yep. Absolutely. The same could be true in, in tons of different areas. If we looked at medicine, if we don't have safeguards around how we use medicine, like maybe it's a painkiller after surgery, if we don't have those safeguards, well, then that freedom will be taken away very quickly, right? And the same would be true within our own financial life. If we don't have redundancies, if we don't have safeguards in place to help us with how we're building our financial life, if we get to where we think we want to go, it might not last forever or as long as we want it to because of the fact that we didn't put those things in place. We talk a lot about in the Lifestyle Investor Group about you know our investment criteria, our due diligence, how we go along these processes. Well, a lot of times, most people aren't even investing. They're just speculating and gambling, putting money in places that somebody else told them to put the money. But when you actually sit down and say, okay, well, why did you do this? What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? Nobody really is able to, to answer you on why they did it and majority of the time is the underlying aspect is they had some FOMO and they had this fear of missing out and we talked about this on uh, you talked about it on your call with Scott the other day about you could be doing great have all this money maybe you even just exited a company and your thought process is man I gotta allocate this money I gotta hurry up I gotta but we need to slow down we gotta figure out why we we're building things that we the way that we are how we want to build them, what do we want our life to look like. And when we can figure out, as our friend Garrett says, how we can win and then play, well then everything else becomes so much easier in life and we get a lot more fulfillment in the things that we're doing rather than just throwing our money at everything that comes our way. Yeah, there's no doubt. And, and as you solve for the financial uh, portion of the equation, it opens up the playbook. Life just takes this really fun transition because it's not about how much money can you make. It's not about paying the bills. It's about what can I do that um, offers the most value? What can I do that inspires me? What can I do that brings out the, the pure joy and passion in me? Who can I spend time with that really lights me up uh, energetically or intellectually? And, and I just think it, it creates a lot more options. Um, and we get to make a decision that doesn't come from the framework of can I afford it or not, which is not always the 
most quality question to be asking when making decisions, both professionally and personally. Right. So, um, how old are you? I will be 26 in less than, I'll be 26 in 25 days. I love it. So you joined the lifestyle investor when you were either 25 or 24. I think it was, was it 24? 24. Okay. Yeah. So at 24 years old, youngest guy to ever join the lifestyle investor, which is really fantastic. But, um, at that age that ha and, and by the way, you've done well financially. So I don't know that it's necessarily a stretch from the financial standpoint. Maybe it was, um, but you're really early on. I feel like a lot of people your age have not figured out the importance of peer group and the importance of, of you know, really like committing to educating yourself in, in different areas, especially areas that you may not know a lot about or, or that are just so important. But why did you join the Lifestyle Investor community? Why at such a young age was this a priority to you? Yeah, so great question. So it, came, it comes from two two guys in my life that are on what I call my board of titans, which is Garrett Gunderson and Mike Isom. So I know from Garrett and what he has mentored me on was that it doesn't take money to make money. It takes value creation to make money. And your income is just a byproduct of the value that you create. That was from Garrett. And then Garrett's old partner and, and uh, one of my mentors um, and he worked with Garrett and my dad a long time ago. What he says often and, and talks to me about is your human life value is the source and creator of your property value. And when I took that to heart, what I noticed was if I invest in myself, if I develop my human life value at such a young age, I mean, there's really nothing that would stop me into the future. And I think it's Thomas Edison or... Thomas Jefferson, one of the one of those guys that talks about nobody can ta ever take away your education. They can't take away what you've learned. And I know that, you know, sure, I might not be putting money in the stock market. Sure, I might not be buying as many real estate properties as I want or maxing out my retirement plans. But what I am doing is putting money back into myself because I know that I am my number one asset and my business is my number one investment. And by doing that, my value will increase which will also increase my income and the ability to do the things that I want to do within life. Mm, that is powerful. Uh, and I'm curious, I've got to imagine your dad also being, you know, um, you know, one of your uh, mentors, advisors. Uh, I'm not sure if, if he's on your, your board of Titans. Um, but what are some lessons that you've picked up from him? Because you seem to have done a great job um, with mentorship, uh, finding wise people, and you've done a great job with, peer group. And those are two of the biggest things that I talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So a um, couple of things that I, I have uh, been fortunate to learn from my dad. One, I will say for that I also talk a lot to the high performing guys that I work with is being a high performer myself and having a lot of success at a young age. He always talked to me about the fact that you don't accept the pedestal and don't accept flattery because that's what most people will, will uh, help you with when they see that you're young and successful. The other things that I also learned from him were things like, Hey, you need to, you need to be in peer groups. You need to be around, uh, people in your life that are going to push you further. Um, even when I was younger and this was completely out of, of, uh, finance and work, he was always trying to put me in a higher age group of playing baseball or working out or doing anything that we were that was competitive, he would always just place me and say, hey, no, you need to go, you need to go a little bit older. Because he knew that when you throw yourself into a position with higher performers, typically you perform at that level. Um, that was those those were some massive lessons that I got from him, uh, just on the mental side of things and why it's so important to develop who you are and put yourself in a position to be in rooms with people that you not only want to surround yourself with, but people you want to be like. That is absolutely well said. And, and, you know, for years I've talked about the most important thing that you invest in is yourself. And if you really boil it down, like, I mean, 
it's so interesting. You know, back when I was learning, there was no such thing as a podcast. You had to go to the library, you had to check out a book. And, and I did that. I did a lot of that. I did a lot of reading. Uh, and, and for me, it was a lot of self-study. I had curiosity. I wanted to learn things. I wanted to figure stuff out. Uh, and so, you know, I, I became a student of whatever it was that was intriguing to me. Uh, for me, as, as life went on, money was just fascinating and, and wealth creation and cash flow and de-risking and uh, insurance of all types, like all these things, real estate. Like it, I just became so fascinated and I just read books and books and books. And now we have the luxury of having podcasts where we can get even more specialized sometimes uh, and hear right from the, the, the mouth or the voice of, of a person that has done it at a high level. And we got to be careful because there are a lot of people out there that are influencers that are teaching something that they actually haven't done. They make money. They make a lot of money. They make their living based on what they're teaching, not on what they've actually done. So I think it's important that we really critique hard who it is we're learning from and, and are they actually world class at the thing that they're teaching? Because mm -hmm. there are a lot of charlatans out there. There's a lot of people that um, uh, make money on a platform make money on uh, education, but not on what they're educating on, right? Yep. So ju just want to say that first and foremost. But when I think about like the best place to invest, for sure, uh, for me, it was in my own self-study. So that's me being intentional with what I uh, read, who I listen to, who I follow, who I learn from. Number two, it's always hiring a coach for whatever area of my life that I want to get better in, you know, right now I have a fitness coach. I have a personal trainer that is literally world-class at, at the things that he does. Uh, he's fantastic. Um, I have um, a pickleball coach because I want to get better at pickleball. And so I've been playing a lot of pickleball and I figure why not hire. Uh, so I got two different coaches. I'm actually tomorrow I'm playing uh, for two hours with one of my coaches, nice. uh, just drilling for skill because I want to cut down the learning curve. Um, but then I, I also have, um, you know, someone in a business area that I want to learn and grow in. And um, for anyone that's listened to Michael Hyatt's podcast, I, I hired him this past year, but I've had many coaches and I always hire coaches. Uh, that's, that's, you know, totally shortcutting that learning curve, right? Yeah. And then uh, from there, it's peer group. Who's yeah. playing the life, who's playing the game of life, the game of business, the game of um, exponential growth, at a higher level, who's playing the game of wealth creation and investing at a higher level, who's playing the game of uh, wealth creation, wealth protection at a higher level than I am. And how do I get into those circles? How do I get into that ecosystem? Um, yeah. And then, you know, the other thing that I'll say is, I think it's really important that we mentor other people. So as we gain expertise, we have mentees, we teach people yeah. the things that we're doing. Um, that to me is so important. And, and as an educator, as an instructor, as someone that um, really highly values empowering other people, um, I learn a lot in the process of teaching uh, people. And so I, I'd love to get some of your thoughts around that too. Absolutely. Um, even myself, um, I have spent, uh, I shouldn't even say the word spent, but invested. I have invested probably triple of what I spent on my college degree at Vanderbilt. And when, and by the way, that's a prestigious school. That's an expensive school. That is a, a, a high price point for education going to Vanderbilt. Hard yeah. to get into also, but like high price point. Yeah. So, so in my own life, you know, uh, I just rehired uh, my father as a coach for my uh, business. Garrett is one of my coaches, both personally and mentally. Um, I have a communications coach because uh, I am very much an introvert and I have uh, quite a problem with having conversations with people and I wanted to get better at that. So I hired a uh, what I call a communications coach and he helps me with questioning and, and talking with other people and um, I, have a, uh, I also have a trainer as well that helps me develop uh, my physicality the way that I want to. And I mean, we are so in line with that thought process of you should always have coaches in your life in areas that you want to grow. Um, and then as you do that, you also want to be in the peer groups of with, with the people that you like and aspire to be. 
But then also, you need to be able to um, coach and mentor people around you as well. Um, that is one of my favorite things to do. I have uh, weekly, I meet with uh, different advisors um, in the financial world that are older than me or, or could be younger than me, um, but they want to know what I know. Uh, you know, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the things that I know, and I've, I've had some pretty good success. So they're coming to me. Well, what I end up finding out is sometimes in our sessions, I actually end up learning more than they do because I'm finally giving it to somebody else and I'm teaching what I think that I know. Yeah, it's powerful what comes out. I record everything, every teaching session that I do, every coaching session I do, every instructional uh, thing or, or keynote, whatever I do, I, I record it because uh, often there's this compounding effect with being in, in different groups or having you know people ask different questions than what you're used to asking where you can kind of take your methodologies and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't even see this, but actually this translates this way. And I, you know, I actually need to look at it through this view. It, yeah. You know, I just, I have these takeaways, these aha moments all the time, uh, which is really fun. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm impressed and jealous that you got started at such a young age, um, hiring coaches, getting into masterminds, getting into, you know, uh, high level peer groups. I just, um, I'm thankful that I have, and, and, um, I just didn't see it. I didn't know about it. I didn't think about it earlier in life. I mean, today it's a lot more common to, to have masterminds than it was back in the day. I mean, the original junta group is, is, you know, kind of where the mastermind came from. And it's some of, you know, uh, the biggest thought leaders out there, some of the most successful entrepreneurs out there, go back and do some research and see some of the, the founding fathers and some of the big names and, and, and the people who were part of that group. But, uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I'm, I'm part of right now, I think I'm in nine different masterminds, uh, which sounds crazy. I don't attend everything. I can't attend everything. But for me, I just find a way to get the value out of the things um, that I do. And, and for me, I can get value. I can, you know, the, the tuition might be a certain price. Let's call it X. You know, maybe it's 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, um, 100,000, whatever the number is. All I have to have is one deal one conversation, one mindset shift, one epiphany, uh, just one thing that can, can shift uh, my perspective and, and create a tangible result that is going to forever pay for that investment. And so, you know, you got started so much younger than I did. I, I don't know where I would be had I not invested in... Um, and myself in this way. I mean, you know, to, to give you perspective on the last two coaches that I've hired, um, each of them were, uh, well into the, to the six figures per year. And each of them with one idea more than covered their cost. Uh, it didn't happen in the first session for anyone, but, I was intentionally like trying to go after it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's really amazing what happens when your mindset is, okay, I don't have to have the scarcity mindset that because I spend this money, I have to go to every event and every function. And you know, you don't want to be a maximizer. You just want to be an optimizer, yeah. right? We don't have to get the most out of something. Uh, it doesn't have to be the biggest. We, we want it to be the most optimal. We want to get uh, the greatest return or the most value. And yeah. so I see this like in my personal life and then in my, you know, professional life personally, it's, it's a fascinating thing. I remember watching, uh, you know, people talk on this and, and reading articles. I read this one article, uh, and, and one of them was on, um, Michael Jordan. One of them was on Tom Brady and one of them was on Brandon Marshall. And each of those individuals talked about how they spent, um, in most cases, over a million dollars, but hundreds of thousands of dollars to a million plus dollars on their body a year. Yeah. And of course, they're athletes. Like, this is what provides them the income. But at the same time, why am I not thinking about that on a smaller scale? Right. And so that gave me the permission, instead of being like thrifty with my dollars, to say, actually, I have a goal. I want to spend, you know, this much money, this hundreds of thousands, you know, on my personal health. That means, hiring a trainer. That means nutrition. That means uh, physical therapy, you know, for, for injuries and making sure that I'm really working through them. That means like the highest quality care chiropractic. That means 
blood work. That means, you know, just really trying to do all the things. And so that's on that personal health side. But I think it's just, and by the way, that's so important because that's the foundation to it all, right? That's what gives the energy, the longevity. But you look at it on the business side, and, and that's what I'm doing with the masterminds. That's what I'm doing with the coaches. That's what I'm doing with my self-study. Um, you know, I try to read about an hour a day every day. And, yeah. and, uh, and a lot of the times, I'll, I'll knock it out doing two things. So I want to get 10,000 steps a day, and so I'll listen to audiobooks for those 10,000 steps, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and so I'll, I'll read in addition to my one hour first thing when I get up. But, uh, you know, I just thought I would share that framework as, as you kind of, you know, inspired that through our conversation, because that's been a game changer for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I think there's some mindsets that you have to have going into those things. Um, one, you also just, you need to have your self study, like, right. You, you've talked about it. My mornings from five to eight thirty is all self study reading, um, in, in doing the things that I want to learn, want to learn. But also I, I've become known in the industry as the guy who just shows up at the learning things. So I go to one to two learning events every single month, but you need Tony. I think Tony Robbins says it the best is the quality of your life is dependent on the quality of questions you ask. And when you can show up with genuine curiosity and that means showing up, not in the mindset of this isn't going to work and I'm going to prove to you why, but Hey, you have a different mindset than me. Let me see if it will work and why it might work for me. I think okay. having those mindsets is Love it. super important going into those, those events. Yeah, that's so good. And, and by the way, what a great addition to what I was saying, because uh, another way to self-study is exactly that. You know, for me, I know that I learn best through immersion. So I like going to conferences. I like going to seminars. I like going to events um, where I can learn. And I think that I learn best when I can, you know, just compound the time in an arena of, of experts where I'm meeting people in the halls and, and, you know, before and after sessions, and I'm in learning from experts who are speaking on whatever the topic is. So I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I'm curious, Brock, um, what are some of the big takeaways that you've had uh, with the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind? Why did you renew? One of the reasons I renewed was because of the people. Um, I mean, our community is massively value, valuable. Um, I, one of the things I joke about a lot of times is like, we actually saved somebody's life in that group. Um, and that, that should just show the value of, of the group there. But being able to show up um, on the first night, and I didn't really, I didn't know I, I knew more speakers than I actually knew members in the group. But when I showed up, what I found was I was in a room of people that was that were like-minded of me. I got to have conversations about golf, about baseball, about just wealth building in general. And that not only helped me grow in, you know, my relationships with other people, but then I, you know, got to be around some of these, the highest performers in our in these different industries and how they invest and why they invest and since then I've had incredible conversations with guys in our group girls in our group of hey you know how do you think about this how do you do due diligence how do you um, what is your investment criteria and how did you come up with that how do you build your life um, and I remember you know I got off the elevator one time and uh, Ryan Thacker and I we were on the same floor I mean guys way older than me, way wealthier than me, you'd think in today's world with social media, like, oh, well, he doesn't have time for me to go away. No, I think we sat in the hallway for 45 minutes to an hour of him just pouring into me, talking about the lessons he's learned, what he's done, how he grows. And that right there is simply one of the greatest factors of why I renewed. Oh, it's amazing. And, and it is about the people. I mean, they're just genuine. They're humble. They're hungry to learn. They're eager to share their gifts. And, and for those of you guys that haven't checked out uh, the episode with Ryan Thacker, go check it out. That guy is a wealth of knowledge. He's incredibly successful. Um, you know, it's funny because we actually shared in that episode, he, he, he shared some things that we had to edit out 
because they, and by the way, we, we virtually never edit anything. It's all just raw and, and unfiltered and free flow. Uh, but uh, he, you know, I, I don't know if it was intentional or unintentional, but he definitely shared, you know, a few things about net worth and cash flow and just a number of things. He's like, oh, that probably shouldn't be out in the world. I don't want to be uh, this huge of a target. But his numbers would make your head spin. Uh, okay. So so check out that episode. And, and what a resource to have that type of conversation and probably even more important that conversation to know you can follow up with him at any time. Yeah. And, and by the way, for anyone like that's the, that's the value is having these people ahead of you in life further along in certain areas that you can reach out to. And this is in any group. So this is not just for lifestyle investor mastermind. This is, I think everyone should have yeah. a group of peers, a group of, of people that play the game of business and life at a higher level that you can reach out to, you can pour into, they can pour into you, you can learn from, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say another thing that since you were talking, uh, at our annual retreat last year, um, you had a panel of our lifestyle investors up there. Well, as I as I consult on other people's finances, you know, I have a lot of these younger uh, guys come in and they're like, Wow, I want to be financially free by 50, 40 years old. And, and then I have to ask the question, okay, well, what's next? And they're like, well, I don't know. I said, well, have, have you ever actually met somebody who's financially free who, who is living the lifestyle that you want? And majority of the time it's, no, actually, I haven't. And when, when I can get a, a, a sense into that world and seeing them, that goes so further for not only me, but then the people that I get to pour into as well. I love it. And, and by the way, that was one of the highest rated sessions that we have ever done is featuring, um, I think it was four different uh, lifestyle investors that are all members that just live an incredible life. They are very thoughtful, they're very successful, but they're very intentional about the the life that they live, what they spend their time doing, spending it with their family, spending it on experiences, um, and, and really just not being a slave to money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's powerful. Well, I, I feel like we we would not have a, a full uh, download of your expertise and your knowledge if we didn't dive into the realm of whole life insurance and. Uh, the positive attributes there, the values to doing it. As, as many people know, I've talked about this many times on uh, the podcast. And for anyone in the mastermind, you know, I've shared this, but I have been um, a whole life owner since I believe it was 2005. I would have to check my uh, original date and my policy is either 2005 or 2006. Um, I think it was 2005. So, uh, you know, we're going on for me close to 20 years and I think it's hard at the beginning to wrap your mind around the power of what whole life can do, the power of building your own bank and creating a framework for which you can do all of your investments. You can buy real estate from borrowing against those funds for the down payment. You can invest in um, you know, investments as, as an LP, for example, uh, with a sponsor by taking a loan against those dollars and, and paying it back with the distributions that come. Um, you can use it as collateral for uh, getting lending from a bank or from a, a, a specialty lending company. And um, it's just, and by the way, some of these specialty lending companies, you can actually use it as collateral and you can get a, a line of credit that you just do interest only loans yeah. uh, with, which is powerful because it becomes that much easier to, um, get a return on those dollars, especially in low interest rate environments. You know, now it's a little different and it's a little trickier and we've got to be um, a, a little bit more conscientious of, of how we use those vehicles. But I'd love to get your thoughts because you not only have been in this space basically your entire adult life, but even your younger years, your more formidable years. And, and your dad is also an expert in this space. Yes, correct. So some realities that I had to come to terms with. One, I want to live a long life. So everything that I do needs to have a long-term viewpoint. And the second is there is no investment that I can put money into other than a 401k if you got 
you know, dragged into that, that you have, that you cannot put money into it without going to a bank account first, right? All money first has to go to a bank account. Well, if I know, especially as a younger person, that no matter how believable it is, I am at my lowest economic point in my life, which means my income is only going to grow from here on out. And I'm going to be saving money from here on out. Well, then that should mean that I should go put money in a place that is not only efficient today, but is also going to be efficient in the long term. And by doing this, by saving my money within the whole life contract, I'm putting myself in a position where I am building a bucket of money that is completely uncorrelated with the market, which we might talk about a little bit later, but I can access that money by borrowing against it without interrupting the growth of the money. And when I, when we break this down, I might break it down into real estate later, but you are going to invest either from a savings account or from a whole life insurance policy. Well, whether whichever one that you invest with, right, invest from, you're going to be paying that account back, right? It's not like we liquidate our savings account to go buy a real estate property and then all of our free cash flow just goes right back into the real estate property. No, it just goes into another bank account. It might not have the same bank account numbers, but the money's still being repaid to a bank account. Well, if we know that, and that's the logic of it, well then we should be taking that cash flow and saving it in a position that's going to grow tax-free, tax-deferred, you can make sure it grows tax-free, you can access it tax-free, in most states it's creditor protected, and you have all these other economic benefits that just make the rest of your financial world so much better. Yeah, tax-free growth, tax-free death benefit, tax-free distribution. Um, creditor protected, uh, and and even in the states where it's not, there are there are vehicles you can use where you can yep. make it creditor protected, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, just at face value, there's tons of perks and tons of advantages, but it, I think it might be fun to kind of dissect it even a little bit more. Um, you know, I think sometimes it gets uh, a bad rap. Uh, from people that don't understand it, that don't know it, or put it in the same bucket as term insurance. You know, you, yeah. you look at term insurance, and and uh, the stat uh, right now is that uh, really about ninety five or ninety six percent of the time, term insurance policies don't pay. Right? right. Uh, they don't pay out. They they um, they, they lapse or they go full cycle. Uh, whereas whole life is different. It is not a term. It's permanent. You can use it for the rest of your life. When whenever something does happen to you, and it's only a matter of time until something does, uh, your heirs can, can benefit from it. But I like that these can be structured in a way that you can benefit from it while you're alive, and then your future generations can benefit from it later on. And you know, Garrett does a good job in, in his book, um, What Would the Rockefellers Do?, uh, yep. which later was rebranded to What Would Billionaires Do?, uh, since the Rockefellers uh, don't like anyone else using their name except them. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, this is kind of the foundation that they had for their family bank, uh, you know, a family that has been able to pass wealth down through generations for a long time, but it's because they have a system, they have a protocol, uh, and everyone in the family kind of bought into that program of everyone has life insurance, everyone borrows against it, um, for education, for starting businesses, for homes, whatever it is. But then they paid it back. Everyone knew you had to pay it back. And that just continued to grow over the years. And so I think it'd be fun to kind of dissect. You, you, you first started talking about something that's uncorrelated. Um, and, and for most of these life insurance companies, they're, they're hev it's a heavy bond portfolio, which is actually really good right now. We're getting yeah. good returns, higher dividends. Yeah. Uh, than we've seen in a long time. Uh, and secondly, you said, you know, that you kind of wanted to get into the real estate play of it. So let's mm -hmm. let's dive in some more. Yeah, so I'm going to start very, very top, and then we're just going to keep getting deeper and deeper. Now, the, the first thing I'm going to say, because you brought up the fact that, you know, these companies are investing in bonds. You and I know, Justin, they don't buy the same bonds that we buy. That's right. right? <laughs> There's a difference between retail investors and these institutional investors, right? That's right. And, and having the strength of them in these mutual insurance companies, 
is way better way to purchase bonds than it is you just coughing up money and trying to buy it in your stock portfolio. That's right. Think about it as you as a retail investor and you're looking to buy, you know, you're looking to do an investment, whatever the investment might be, versus you coming in with a group of people versus mm -hmm. you coming in with a pension yeah. versus you coming in with, uh, you know, a, a, um, a capital that is the size of um, <laughs> so, some of the largest companies balance sheets, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So very top level. Okay. Most of the time, most people would say, okay, well, you know, I, I can just buy term and invest the difference rather than buying whole life. So if we were to look at the world of buy term and invest the difference from a very high level, what you're saying is I'm going to buy term insurance and invest what I'm not putting in term insurance into the market. Well, the reality is when you do that and you get to retirement, you cancel your life insurance. And which means your assets that you built over all this time now have to be your lifetime income, not just for you, but also your, your spouse, if you have one. And then, you know, your life insurance because you canceled yours. So you self-insured, which is really just, you don't have any insurance. So studies have shown that the safe withdrawal rate to make sure that you have enough money left over is about 2.7%. So taxable, think about how many millions of dollars you need to produce the income that you want during retirement. Whereas if you showed up at the day of retirement and you knew that your death was a win scenario, because my dad likes to say everybody lives until they don't, which is pretty obvious, but apparently we don't understand this. Whole life is a win product, W, W H E N, so that we can W I N win, is the reality that if we can show up at the day of retirement with the same amount of death benefit to the same amount of assets, that means we have a much greater distribution rate, but also much greater distribution options in retirement. Okay, so that that would be the first like super super high level why you would want whole life in your portfolio. The second is, okay, well, let's talk about, you know, how does whole life insurance work? Okay. And I will, I'm going to preface here and say, I am specifically not talking about index universal life, variable universal life, any type of universal life. When I am saving money, I want to put it in a place that has no risk of loss. It's guaranteed to be there. I can access it and it's liquid. Okay. With those vehicles, sometimes that's not uh, an ability that they can provide. So I'm only talking about whole life. Well, if we compared it to real estate, in real estate, we go buy a property, right? And it has a mortgage payment. Well, as we pay that mortgage payment, it builds equity in that property. And then that property also has a market value. Well, we know the equity cannot go above the market value. The equity, we can borrow it, we can use it, we can do whatever we want with it. Whole life insurance is the exact same. We pay a premium. As we pay the premium, it builds equity in the policy also known as cash value. Well, that policy has a death benefit, and we know that cash value can never go above the death benefit. We can borrow it, we can use it, and we can do with it whatever we want. The difference is, and I think you should have both, but the difference is, if, you know, when we look, when we look at real estate is, it does fluctuate with the market if, you're, if we're looking at single family homes. It fluctuates with the market. Credit checks, you know, we gotta jump through some hoops to get the money, um, I hope it never happens again, but they could call the loans back, right? Whereas with the life insurance policies, I mean, the only qualification is that you make sure that you sign your policy loan document and you send an avoided check. And then they send it to you within three to five business days, seven days maybe if it's an end of year and it's super busy, right? But it does not fluctuate. It goes up and it's guaranteed to go up over time even if you don't get any dividends. Okay. Yeah, and the interesting thing is you actually don't have to pay your loans back. I mean, it performs better if you do, but you're borrowing from your own dollars. So if you don't pay it back, and at the end of the story, whenever you pass away, uh, that that death benefit just reduces out the, um, you know, the cost of the loans that you hadn't repaid, and, and that's it. Now, if you want you know, to, to optimize, then you'd certainly want to pay those back. Yeah. 
but I've used my whole life policy as, as the down payment for uh, virtually every piece of real estate we have ever bought. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would pay it back so that it builds up and then I can borrow again and then I pay it back so it builds up. Um, and I have used it for many of the other investments I've done. So buying businesses, whether buying them outright, buying a minority piece, buying a majority piece, uh, you know, they've been very handy for that. Uh, I've used them for LP investments. Um, so I, I've used it across the board for so many things. And what I also love um, about, I mean, the list goes on and on, on, on things that I like and, and ways that I've used it. Um, but when I think about like the versatility of it, when I think about it from the standpoint of like, this is uh, consider it like a fixed income product. Like this is, you know, when you look at your asset allocation, you look at the, the way that the wealthiest people in the world allocate their wealth, what percentage to what, you know, what, how much is real estate? How much is public equity? How much is private equity? How much is uh, private credit? Um, how much is fixed income? And so this, you know, th there's a group that we just had uh, with, you know, share with the lifestyle investor. It was Scott Ford, Way to Wealth. I did a podcast a while back with Scott, uh, but their methodology around Way to Wealth is just incredible. And um, they actually like half of your net worth being in fixed income, AKA being in life insurance yeah, or life Ab insurance products, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's important because you want that uncorrelated asset that you're building this war chest, you're building this capital fund, this opportunity fund to get into these other assets without having to liquidate something else. Or, you know, cause what they want to talk about a lot of times is, Oh, well, we need to make sure our asset allocation is still balanced. We had a 60-40, but now it's 70-30, so we got to sell some of our stocks to get back to our bonds. Well, I don't know if you know this, but you're going to cause a tactical event when you sell some of your stocks to buy some more bonds. What if your bond portfolio was within the whole life contract, not having to completely always balance it within this portfolio that your money manager has tried to get you to have this whole time. Yeah, I love that. I also think it's important that we're not trying to maximize the return in our portfolio on all the dollars. Right. Most people make their wealth via concentration, but the wealthiest people maintain and grow their wealth via diversification. Right. And what that means is that you've got different buckets or different allocations that you are targeting a different return to. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make 15% on all your money. You have yeah. a bucket that you want to make 15% on. You can have a bucket that you want to make closer to 20% on. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe even on the high risk stuff, which, you know, that, that's generally um, a very small allocation, usually about 1%, sometimes less. Sometimes it's not even there on, on early stage seed round, like super high risk. Um, but, you know, every wealthy person that I know has money sitting in uh, cash, cash equivalent, and fixed income. Um, and, and that provides liquidity, it provides cash flow, it provides uh, the opportunity to outperform in certain markets when the other part of the portfolio isn't performing. And I think that's really important to recognize. You know, I, I've talked a lot about um, you know, markets and whether they're efficient or inefficient. And when you look at like the stock market, it's the most efficient thing in the world. It's really hard to beat uh, the algorithms that are out there to beat the quants. Yeah. It's not even the quants you have to beat anymore. It's the algorithms. It's the AI that they have created that you have yeah. to be able to beat. And on a short-term basis, on a day trading basis, there's just no chance. Yeah. You know, if you read Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys, like you will learn that you just don't stand a chance. Yeah, uh, and and I mean for the long haul, you certainly can can grow your wealth, and and if you invest, you know, especially in index funds, that's your lowest cost way of doing it, um, and uh, and and getting the diversification in the long run, you know, really playing that out. And if you want to buy, if you want to borrow against it to buy assets, so it's the opposite of what most people do. They sell stock to rebalance, and there's a taxable event. Mm -hmm. Well. If you have dollars in there and it's a smaller allocation and it grows over time, you can borrow against it to then buy, uh, you know, other assets. Um, and so, you know, when I think about, um, you know, just th this part of the portfolio and, and um, the way these dollars are, are being used, I just think it's it's we all want to recognize that certain dollars are for certain 
activities. So if you're over here being really efficient, it's harder to make money. I like being on the other side, really inefficient, much easier to make money. You get much, uh, out, much more outsized returns because that inefficiency creates opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so that to me, you know, what I have found is that it lands more on the alternative investment side where you're seeing real estate and private equity and private credit. Yep. Um, and, and really some of this is also concentration, right? So yep. like what, what's the most institutionally owned? What's the most uh, concentrated? What's, so if you look at like the stock market, you've got so much institutional money there. You've got so many big players. You look at, you know, there, there's definitely a lot of institutional money in real estate, but there's less concentration and less consolidation in certain asset classes. Yeah. And, and so like mobile home parks are one of the least consolidated asset classes out there. So there's outsized returns. Yeah. Um, multifamily is probably one of the most consolidated asset classes in real estate. And, and so it's harder to get a good return but you still can because it's still more inefficient than the stock market. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a hundred percent on board with you. And I think when you can position yourself to take advantage of these opportunities and you have the approach of the guy with the longest time horizon always wins, you, you are over the long term, you will win because you're able to take advantage of these. Yeah, hundred percent, Brock. This has been so much fun. You are so wise for your age. I'm so impressed with what you've been able to accomplish. Your mindset, the way you look at the world, the way you look at growth, the way you look at your network and your peer group and coaching and uh, it's just it, whole life. All these things that you're doing, you're having major impact on the world. You're you're influencing and and you know helping serve a really important group of young entrepreneurs out there. Uh, so I want to thank you for making the time to be here, but I also want to make sure our audience knows where they can reach you and, and find out more about you and what you're doing and for anyone that would be a good fit for your services that they can contact you. Yeah, so I think one of the best ways would be LinkedIn. I do a lot on LinkedIn. I, I think you can just find me at Brock Fortner. Um, and then um, since this was more of a financial discussion, email me at my financial um, email. So my team can can receive it uh but that would be uh, i think it's brock at stone century financial uh, dot com and if you just shoot me a message i will either see it unless my team catches it before me but i'll be sure to be able to talk to anybody about the growth that uh, they're seeking I love it. Well, uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I hope people take advantage of this opportunity to reach out to you, to get to know you, to learn from you. Uh, and, and I hope that you find some, some right fit um, uh, clients and business partners and entrepreneurs that you can create, you know, the one plus one equals three type of scenario. Uh, and I love wrapping up every episode that we do with a question for our audience. So if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, my question for you, it's the same every week. What is one step you can take today to move towards financial freedom, to move towards a life that you truly desire? So it's on your terms. It's not a life by default, but a life by design. And I challenge you to go after it, to, to take one nugget, one thing that you learned from Brock today and move and pivot towards that life that is on your terms. Thanks, and we'll catch you next week.